Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Let the Bible Speak. My name is Alex Meredith. I'll be your host for today. And I uh, hope you have a Bible with you, whether that's a paper copy. You can look it up on your phone, uh, pull it up on your computer, whatever you need to do. We've got a great lesson and great message for you here today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about God's guidance, uh, something that I know I often think about, something that I know a lot of you are often thinking about. Uh, because we are always looking to the future. We're always trying to figure out what's next. And a lot of us, you know, you know, if you're a Christian especially, you're looking at, you know, what does God want me to do next? Uh, and trying to figure out what, what His plans for us are, right? So I know that God's guidance is a particular topic that's on our minds a lot, but one that maybe we don't talk about very often. So we're going to be talking about that here today. Uh, I actually want to start by talking a little bit about myself, uh, just telling you a little bit about uh, my experience with God's guidance and what brought me here uh, to this point where I am today. So I'm only going to go back a little bit. I'm not going to tell you my life story, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background, back in the spring of 2018, uh, I had just graduated from undergrad uh, in Arkansas and got my bachelor's degree and was all excited about uh, the possibility of ministry. And I also wanted to do grad school, so I tried everything at once. I did grad school. I did um, started a new ministry position at a church. I just had a baby with, with my wife. Uh, so I had all these things all at once start to happen and realized that something had to go. So uh, no more grad school for now anyway. Uh, but, of course, kept on with the ministry position, and I was really excited about it. Uh, you know, I, I was just excited to do anything in that field. It, it had what, it's what I'd been uh, training and preparing for for the last several years, and I was really excited to get into it. Um, and, and it went, went pretty well at first. Uh, things were going well, and, and I was just thrilled to be there. But about a year in, about a year and a half in or so, uh, we started to have some, some problems come up. And I'm not going to go into all the details here, uh, and I'm not trying to single out any one person or church or anything like that. But basically, things weren't going well, and it turned into a really unhealthy situation. And I was very frustrated by it. I knew that I wanted out of that particular situation, and I thought at the time that I just wanted to be out of ministry entirely. Uh, I mean, I was that frustrated by it. So I got out. And then me and my family, you know, we had to figure out what we're going to do next, you know. That's what I was doing for a living. That was our income. And so I had to figure out what to do next. We had just bought a home, too. Uh, again, we were very hopeful. We thought we knew the path that we should go on. Um, but we had just bought this home. We didn't think we could sell it. And so we were looking to stay where we were. And um, I, I sort of fell back on one of my, I guess you could call it a childhood interest, but it lasted a real long time and uh, still is an interest of mine to this day, uh, which is the field of law enforcement. Uh, and I had had some experience and sort of the beginner level training and all of that. And so I started applying to different police departments in the area. Uh, there in central Arkansas. Uh, two of them <coughs> really got my attention and were 
uh, you know, I was involved in the hiring process for both of them, ended up choosing one of them. And a actually, what's funny about it is on the day that my, my son was born, on that very day, I was there for the birth, okay, but that night I actually went to go take the written test for one of these departments. So there was a feeling of massive change in the air, to say the least, right? So I started with this one department uh, and started into the training portion, and I quit. Uh, long story short, it didn't work out, wasn't going to be for me, and so I quit. But then that started a new journey of, all right, what do we do next? Because now we're really in trouble. Now we've got to figure out something really fast. And that's where, you know, I had taken this brief hiatus from ministry. And, and you know, at, at that time, uh, in the fall of 2019, I had become so frustrated by the whole situation that was going on. And at one particular instance, I, I was just disenchanted and I thought, I, I don't want to do this ever again. But after that break, I realized that I missed it. And I realized that I didn't feel like I could do without it. So I started looking for ministry positions, um, different places. And, uh, you know, the idea of the UP, you know, Marquette came to mind. Or, or, you know, I saw it on a list of all these other possibilities. We've could, we could have gone to Texas, to Georgia, to Tennessee. We had all these... Uh, options that were near to these places that we were familiar with and then of course Marquette came up and we applied uh, initially you know almost jokingly thinking there's no way this is going to work out you know but then one thing happened after another and wow I, and, and the people here have just you know made this home for us uh, and we were able to sell our house you know I don't believe any of that was coincidence right and I look back at all of those frustrating things that happen, whether it's uh, between the police work or, uh, you know, the frustrating situation with the other congregation. And I think, is it possible, even if God maybe didn't cause the mess, is it possible that God was working through the mess to bring us to where we are now, right? And, you know, that's my experience. Uh, that sometimes God closes one door in order to open another. And maybe that's your experience too. One door is closed and another one opens up, right? Well, our, our text today, and we'll, we're going to come back to this idea of guidance and providence and, and all of that. Uh, and it relates to our text today, which is Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Now, a little bit of background here. This is during Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, the first missionary journey, by the way, in Acts 13 and 14. Um, it, you know, it took place over a relatively large area, you could say. But if you look at it on a map, it, it was all rather compact. You know, he's uh, traveling from the area of Jerusalem um, out towards Sicily and then over... Uh, not Sicily, Cyprus, sorry. And then up to the southern part of modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, and then he circles back, right? Well, the second missionary journey starts out similarly. He starts out in Jerusalem and moving north uh, up into Samaria. And then he starts to curve a little bit over towards uh, this area that he hasn't been before. So this is where we're picking up in Acts 16, starting in verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So first of all, I just want to point out this idea that, you know, these things happen one after another, uh, not not always obviously God, right? 
Um, even the vision, you could argue, well, you could, maybe some of Paul's companions said this to him, are you sure it wasn't just a silly dream? But he, they were convinced at the end of this, it says God had called them to preach the gospel, right? So they were convinced that God was involved in all of this. And what's happened after the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15? They're moving from Jerusalem. They move north to Antioch of Syria. Uh, this is where Paul and Barnabas separate, by the way. And then they're moving to Derbe, to Lystra. Uh, this is where Timothy joins the party. So it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy at Lystra. And then they attempt to go into Asia, it says. Uh, so, they're attempting to go one direction, and they're not allowed to, right? At this point, it says they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And I don't know what that looked like. Uh, you know, I don't know if this is maybe a Garden of Eden situation where you've got, uh, got a cherubim, an angel, a heavenly being of some sort with a flaming sword that's saying, no, none shall pass, you know. I don't know exactly what this looks like, okay? But one way or another, they were convinced that the Holy Spirit was not wanting them to go in that direction. And it was forbidding them, in fact, from going that direction. And so they then attempt to go into Bithynia. Bithynia is to the north, right? Bithynia is to the north, and they try to go that way. And it says, once again, they were not allowed to. Uh, the Spirit of Jesus, it says, did not allow them. Again, I don't know what this looked like. But they believed one way or another that they were not supposed to go that way. And so they go the only direction that makes sense at this point. Uh, they had prevented, being, been prevented from going this way and now this way, so they went right through the middle. And they go up through Mysia into Troas. Now Troas, uh, on the western end of modern-day Turkey, on the western end of Asia Minor in ancient times, this was a port city. It lied uh, on the sea, and just across the water, you have modern-day Greece. That's where Philippi was. That's where this whole region of Macedonia was, okay? So there at Troas is where Paul has this vision of a man in Macedonia calling, Come help us. And Paul takes that as divine guidance, and they go over to Philippi, right? Now, again, I just think this is so remarkable because what we see God doing here, he's closing two doors, not just one door. He closed two doors in the face of Paul. You can't go that way. You can't do that. But what did Paul keep doing? He kept looking for the open door. And sure enough, God opened another door. Now, our tendency, when we're trying to pursue God's mission, we like to run at the first sign of, trou uh, first sign of trouble, right? We say, well, maybe we should do this, right? And so we start trying to do that. And then an obstacle, an obstacle comes up. And we think, well, I guess that's not going to work out. Let's just go home. Let's pack our bags. What did Paul do? He said, all right, well, let's look for another way to do this. How can we still carry out the mission and will of God, even if it's, you know, around that obstacle? Paul kept on looking for the open door, uh, and I think that's really important here. He kept looking for ways to pursue God's mission. He didn't give up, uh, even though it's really easy to give up when that happens, right? So why did this happen? Why does this happen? Why is it that sometimes there are doors closed in our face and new ones opened? This is true from my experience. This is true uh, for other people's experience. I think this was true for Paul, even though he didn't see it yet or didn't know it yet. I think God knows what's best for us better than we do. Do you agree? I think God knows what's best for us better than we do. Think about Paul's situation, right? He was wanting to go first almost back into these places that he had kind of already been, right? Um, one of the places you might argue was a really, really dangerous place that might not have been receptive to the gospel yet. In fact, Paul could have gotten killed. Uh, another place that Paul wanted to go to uh, was arguably a place that maybe wasn't ready quite yet. And then later on in that second missionary journey, he circles back around to Ephesus in the southeast or southwestern portion of Asia. 
Uh, and then he goes back to Ephesus and has this an enormously positive relationship built with them there. Uh, a lot of that is surrounding the context of some of the um, riots that end up happen happening on the third missionary journey, right? So God knows the timing that needs to happen. God understands the situation in ways that we do not, right? I think that God was working for Paul's benefit and for the benefit of the gospel and for the benefit of this mission, even though Paul may not have been able to see how quite yet. And I think that's true in our own lives. God redirects us to certain directions sometimes that we don't understand why. We don't know why we can't go that way, but God does. I'm reminded of a passage in Proverbs. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have heard this passage before, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Let me read this to you. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. So talking about God's guidance, don't lean on your own understanding, lean on God's He'll make your path straight. He'll set you straight and set you on the, in the right direction. And because of God's redirection for Paul, he was able to go to a place that had not really been reached by the gospel in full force yet. Right? He was able to go to Philippi. He was able uh, to speak with Lydia and her family, and her whole family was converted and baptized into Christ. The Philippian jailer, that whole situation with Paul and Silas in prison and the earthquake and the jailer almost taking his own life. And then, uh, and then they tell him the truth of the gospel and uh, all of that. None of that would have happened without God's redirection. The whole spreading of the gospel through Macedonia and Thessalonica and then, then Athens and through Berea. None of that would have happened without God's redirection here and Paul's expansion of his mission, I think really contributed to Christianity's explosion that happened in the first and second centuries that I think is still having an effect on the world today. I think that's part of why many of us were able to grow up with a knowledge of the gospel. We were able to go to vacation Bible schools and able to grow up with these stories about Jesus primarily because there is this explosion of knowledge of Jesus in the first and second centuries that Paul was a part of uh, that had this ripple effect through time. Uh, if you've ever heard of the butterfly effect, right? That's sort of what's happening here. One little thing through the course of time can have a tremendous impact down the road. And I think that's true here with Paul. Now, this wasn't the first time that God had closed one door and opened another. Uh, there's sort of a biblical pattern here, and I want to look at a few instances of that today. So go to Genesis chapter 12. Again, we're just going to look at a few passages here, uh, instances of God closing one door in order to open another. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. By the way, at this point, Abram has already made a big move. Uh, moving his family over vast geographical distance, and now uh, God is hoping that he will trust him again. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So they weren't to stay in Ur. They were to go to the land of what would later be known as the land of the Assyrians. Then not, were, not only were they told to do that, uh, but they were going to leave the Assyrian land and then go to Canaan. right? So <laughs> talk about shutting one door and opening another. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that definitely happened for Abraham and his life. If we go to Genesis 17, there's another good instance of this. Genesis 17, verse 18, starting in verse 18. There we go. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. 
I will establish my covenant with him as, as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So this is a time when Abraham was looking uh, to who you know, this promise of covenant would be passed on to. It wasn't going to be Ishmael. That's what Abraham thought was going to happen. It was actually going to be Isaac. And without that, you wouldn't have had Jacob. Without Jacob, you wouldn't have had the 12 tribes of Israel. You wouldn't have had the whole story of Egypt and the Exodus. Uh, and Moses. None of that would have happened if God had not redirected the situation here. If God didn't close one door and open another. Maybe Abraham couldn't see the wisdom in it at the time. But that was God's... God's plan, and it worked out. Uh, we're not going to read it right now, but 1 Samuel 15, 24 to 28, Saul is rejected as king. David is appointed as king, right? So closing the door on Saul, opening the door for David, which would uh, create this whole Davidic line, which would not only produce a series of kings that are heirs of David, this would also lead to Jesus being born, Jesus being a direct descendant from David. Right? So again, none of this would have happened without God's redirection. Acts chapter 9, God slammed a door on the old, uh, the old Saul and opened the door for the new Saul uh, who repented and turned away from his sin and turned, towards, uh, and turned to become one of the greatest missionaries of all time for the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 1, I do want to read this. Again, talking about... God slamming one door to open another. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 17. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to, to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So God said no to sin and yes to righteousness, no to death, and yes to life. So praise God for His wisdom and for His redirection. And so I look at all of this. I look at the biblical pattern. I look at what happened in Acts 16, right? I see all of these instances of redirection. And the conclusion that I come out with is that sometimes God redirects our lives so that we can better live out His purpose and His design for us. Okay, So this redirection is all about fulfilling God's will and fulfilling and carrying out His mission to bring Christ into the world. So when was the last time a door was slammed in your face? Um, Maybe this happened sometime recently. Maybe it's in the past. Maybe it's happening right now. Maybe it's sometime in the future, and it will happen. My advice, and really I think the Bible's, is to continue to look for the open doors, continue to look for ways to serve, to love, and to live out God's mission, because there's probably an open door close by. God is going to continue to allow you uh, means and opportunity to serve and to love and to fulfill his mission. Now, a couple of important notes here about God's guidance and God's providence, and these are really important, okay? So, my first note about God's guidance, just because a negative leads to a positive does not mean that God caused a negative. I know that's kind of abstract thought for a second, but let me explain what I mean. When we think about God's guidance, uh, you know, something positive often comes out of tragedy right? Because I think God works for the good of those who love Him, even through a mess not of His own creation, right? But it's a theological mistake to say, oh, because something good came out of this, it must be that God caused the problem, right? Uh, the classic example here is, you know, parents lose, lost their three-year-old child in this tragic accident, and uh, through this journey that somebody 
you know, that people are brought on a, a spiritual and emotional journey because of that event. Somebody ends up converting to Christ. And some people would look at that and say, well, look, see, God took away your child for a reason. First of all, don't say that. That is bad, uh, bad counseling, bad pastoral advice. Don't say that. Uh, second of all, you're making a theological assumption uh, that's not necessarily correct, right? Uh, God can work through bad situations and through His guidance and providence, He can bring good to a situation that is already incredibly messed up, okay? So that's one thing I want to point out. Uh, the second thing to point out here, God is not going to... God is not going to direct you to violate His will. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this idea one time, and um, she told me about a, a post that she had seen on Facebook. It's kind of humorous, but I, I guess kind of sad, really. Uh, but it was addressed to a group of women, and it said, Ladies, God's not going to send you another woman's husband. <laughs> and I thought, that's perfect. Because sometimes we are totally convinced God is leading me to do this. Well, a good litmus test is to say, all right, would this thing that I think God is leading me to do, is this in a line with His will or not? And if it's not, God is not leading you there. Which leads me to another point. Everybody wants to know what does it look like? What does God's guidance look like? Is it a voice in my head? Well, that can be tricky to, to pinpoint. Um, what about a vision or a dream? Does that kind of thing still happen? Uh, what about a feeling? Well, the flesh can be misleading, right? So how do we know when God is guiding us? And for that, I'm just going to read you this passage from Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So Jesus is the chief means of revelation to us today. So if you really want to know where God is calling you, if you really want to know if God is calling you, learn about Jesus. Read, study, learn about his life. And I bet you'll be surprised at how much you can get out of that. Okay, so learn about Jesus. Whatever, God, uh, whatever new door God is leading you through, uh, I hope that with a mind and eye towards God's mission and design, uh, and design, excuse me, you're ready to go. And we want to help you in that journey. Uh, we don't quite have time to go through uh, all of the usual stuff that we do at the end here, but I'll just tell you this. If we can help you in that journey, if there's anything that we can do to assist you in taking the next steps in your spiritual journey, uh, let us know. You can go to letthebiblespeak.net. A lot of our contact information is on there. Information about our worship services are on there if you'd like to attend. Please just let us know. We hope you have a great week. May God bless you in all of your endeavors. Lord.